Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life, your true crime channel, your one-stop destination, because we literally talk about it all. We talk about cold cases, current cases, unsolved cases, twisty, gross cases, graphic cases, literally. We talk about everything and we talk about real-time cases. So if you're brand new and stopping by for the first time and you enjoy the channel and you want to support it, hit that subscribe button below and subscribe to the channel so that you get notified of case videos as I upload them and live streams when I go live when there are case updates um, for real-time cases that we're following. And for all of you returning subscribers, you already know the drill. Welcome back. So happy to have you guys here today. All right, guys, so the case we're talking about today, I got to give you a little bit of a warning. It is not easy. And I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately because I feel like a lot of the cases, especially the ones that you guys have been recommending that I cover, haven't been easy at all. And this one is just like, it's not even the fact that it's graphic. It's just so upsetting and so I don't, I don't even know how to put it into words. If you come up with the word as you're watching it, please let me know. But again, this is a case that has been highly, highly requested from all of you, and it is very, very disturbing. Like, beyond. Ten to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. On July 29th, 1995, it was supposed to be a normal day for the Phillips family, who lived in Baraboo, Wisconsin, Nothing was out of the ordinary, and it was supposed to be a great family day. The family had just moved in to their new home just two weeks prior, and they were still settling in. But around 1.30 a.m. that early morning, the 12-year-old son, Thad Phillips, was awoken by the sensation of being carried. Thad had fallen asleep on the couch while watching TV after dinner, so initially he had just figured that his parents likely his dad probably, was carrying him to bed. And this happens obviously so often with young kids, toddlers, even, you know, preteens, you, they fall asleep and then you carry them to bed. So he thought that this is what was happening and he fell back asleep, but then woke up again when he was actually being placed on the ground. And obviously he was very confused by this, but at first he thought that maybe it was just a family friend who was in the house because he realized that he didn't recognize right away that it was his dad still half asleep. So he figured maybe it was a family friend, but confused as to why he was being set on the ground. It was just weird. And then he realized though that this was an unfamiliar face and that this person wasn't an adult, it was a boy who was likely just a few years older than him. And this boy, Joseph Clark, asked Thad if he could actually run home with him. So even though Thad was still a bit confused, a bit sleepy, apparently he went with Joseph. Joe was apparently nice and wasn't giving Thad any sort of red flags or indication that it was going to be a red flag, even though we know if like a stranger is carrying you out of your house, it is a red flag, but I mean, I guess I kind of get it. He was tired, he was young, he was new to the area. I don't know. I don't know, guys. But this case also took place back in 95, where people were a lot more trusting and times were different. Literally, you wouldn't have to be home until the streetlights were on, everybody was playing, walking to and from school, and it isn't like it is today, unfortunately. So Thad was just trusting and, you know, went with Joseph to his house. At first he figured that perhaps Joe was just having car troubles and was unable to wake his dad. But who was Joe, you may want to know, because that is really the unlock to this entire case. Joseph Joe Clark was a 17-year-old boy living in Wisconsin. He lived with his mother and his brother. And from the outside, he looked like a normal teenage boy. But deep down, there was something much deeper going on. Joe was a sadist. He got pleasure in watching other people experience pain. And what happened over the next 43 hours to Thad is absolutely horrifying. Thad and Joe walked to Joe's house about a half a mile away from Thad's family home. And Joe was telling Thad on this walk about a party that he was throwing at his house that night. He even mentioned some of the friends from school. So even though Thad still didn't recognize Joe, the fact that Joe knew his friends and knew them by name was convincing enough that he was somehow in the mix, that he should be trusted. 
After all, most people don't expect that a teenager from their school is really, you know, out to get them or target them. So when they got to Joe's house, Thad immediately noticed how nasty the house was. I mean, and it was filthy. There was trash everywhere. It was disgusting. There was like a layer of filth, just gross asked Thad if he wanted to go and see the model cars in his bedroom while they waited on the other guests to arrive for this party. Thad went upstairs to the bedroom without a clue of what was coming next. When they got upstairs, Thad was looking at the model cars in the bedroom, and as soon as he heard the door close, Thad's life as he knew it came to a screeching halt. While looking at the cars, Joe came in and lifted Thad's 90-pound body and threw him on the bed. Now, I am guessing you probably think you know where this is going, but I assure you, you do not. And I assure you, it is worse than what you're thinking. So by this point, Joe was apparently in a rage mode, while Thad was in a fight-or-flight mode. And Thad was just desperately trying to figure out how to escape this situation and escape this house. So Joe becomes so enraged that he grabs Thad's right ankle and twisted it until it literally snapped and splintered. Thad obviously tried to make a run for it as best as he could, but he wasn't able to get out of the room or the house in time before Joe caught up to him. And that is when things went from bad to worse. After Joe snapped Thad's thigh, he sat on the couch next to Thad, having casual conversation with him. It was almost like a Jekyll and Hyde situation, where he was a monster one minute and then nice the next, as though nothing just happened. So Joe starts discussing his family, his interests, and the work that he does on his car, and just divulging all of this casual, friendly information to Thad, who he just severely injured. So of course Thad, who was fighting for his life at this point, decides that the best way that he could get out of this situation was to become friends with the enemy, become friends with Joe. And Thad, this poor kid was literally just 12 years old and he was in excruciating pain. And at this point, he didn't know how long the pain was going to continue and he also wasn't receiving proper medical care. And the injuries that we are talking about, guys, here are worse than typical injuries. His body was clearly in shock because nobody would be able to even just sit through a conversation after dealing with these injuries. And luckily, I would imagine that the shock set in to where he, nece he didn't necessarily feel every single ounce of pain. But it's honestly a wonder that he didn't die from this horror, honestly, as soon as his ankle and his thigh were broken, especially in the way that they were broken. And of course, at this point, so many thoughts are going through Thad's mind. Not only that he's going to try to befriend the enemy to get himself out of this situation, but even more than that, why? What did he do to deserve this? Why was he targeted? And why would somebody even want to do something this gruesome to another human being? So when he asks Joe, why? Why me? Why this? Joe tells him that he likes the sounds of bones crushing. Guys, let me repeat that. He says that he likes the sounds of bones crushing, but that he can never get the angle right to crush his own bones. I'm sorry, but I, in all of the cases I've ever covered and all of the documentaries I've ever seen and true crime that I have witnessed or researched, I have never, ever heard of something like this. I have never heard of somebody who physically gets off, yes, on pain, but, but never that they physically get off by hearing the sound of bones crunching. And the fact that he's saying he can never get the angle right to crunch his own, I mean, Unfortunately, missed opportunity. I wish he would have so that he wouldn't inflict this pain on other people. But like, this guy obviously is not right in the head. So Joe then tells Thad that this is not the first time that he has done this to somebody. And he tells him that Thad is actually his third victim. He tells Thad that one of the other boys' name was Chris, and then he also tells him another name. So around 4 a.m. that morning, when Thad's dad realized that Thad was no longer on the couch and not anywhere in the home, he obviously became panicked. His parents were obviously worried, and so they called the police. But the police and both his parents were completely stumped. 
They had no idea where he could have gone. There was no indication of foul play or an abduction, and Thad was overall a good kid. His parents knew that he wouldn't have just left, so something was wrong here, but they had no idea what possibly could have happened. His parents knew that something was wrong for sure, but they had no clue that their son was being tortured beyond belief. After Joe and Thad sat on that couch together and got, you know, closer that day and became friendly, Joe went out on a date with his girlfriend but not before he made sure that Thad would be incapacitated. And he beat and twisted Thad so badly that his kneecaps were backwards. And that only motivated Thad to get out of this horror house as fast as he could even more. So after Joe left to go on this date, Thad actually threw himself down the stairs and tried to get to a phone to try to get help and get out of here. But he couldn't make it in time before Joe got home. So Thad did what he could think of in the moment and he hid behind a couch. But when Joe found him, Joe was fuming and things were about to get a lot worse. Joe continued to torture Thad into the night. He had broken tons of blood vessels in him and Thad was in excruciating pain and truthfully detrimental condition. The next morning, Thad decided that he was going to ask Joe if he could call his parents. He just wanted to talk to his parents and have that little bit of comfort. So Joe told Thad, sure, of course you can call your parents. Of course you can talk to your parents. It's totally okay. And he actually hands him a phone, but it didn't take long for Thad to realize that the phone was actually not a working phone. And Joe was doing this as a way to, you know, get more pleasure, get his kicks even more to just trick Thad and really have this control over him and say, yeah, call him, but knowing the phone's not working, just disgusting. He was tricking Thad and he had total control over Thad and Thad was really at the mercy of him. So at this point, Thad was obviously desperate. All he wanted was his parents. He wanted to be rescued, this 12 year old boy. So he began trying to bargain with Joe. He tried promising that he would absolutely never speak about what happened. He said that he would tell people that he just tripped and fell over a coffee table and he, that he would never ever say that Joe did anything to him, just really trying to get in his good graces and convince him that he won't tell. So then the two boys go back to hanging out on the couch again until Joe decided that it was time for more punishments. Can you believe that? Even more, like this kid hasn't gone through enough. So he carried Thad back upstairs and repeated that twisted ankle break, but this time it was on the left side. He twisted it so hard. He twisted Thad's ankle so hard, guys, that his foot was backwards. Thad was fighting back and was hitting Joe, and Joe told Thad that he needed to hold a pillow over his face or that he would then break his neck or his back because apparently during all of these torture sessions, Joe always put a towel or a pillow over Thad's face to muffle him. Even though Joe's mom wasn't home at the time, he didn't want to risk any chance of being caught. But the fact that this kid had the balls enough to do this in his own family home blows my mind. This is crazy, guys. So as soon as he was done with these torture sessions, he would then pretend to give Thad medical care. He would make up bandages and wrap his legs up in padded socks and make them look as though they were cats. It was bizarre. And then after these torture sessions, because Joe got off on it, he would pleasure himself in front of Thad, then carry him downstairs to watch TV, to engage in friendly conversation like before, before repeating the cycle all over again. But he wouldn't start the friendly conversation on the couch and bringing him downstairs until he put braces on Thad's legs and forced him to walk around with these horrendously broken bones. These sessions were repeated multiple times throughout the day. And at one point, Joe actually jumped on Thad's back with his knees trying to suffocate him. Thad's knee was also twisted completely backwards. At another point, Thad was put on a board at the top of the stairs, and then the board was removed from under him, and he fell down the stairs all the way down. I can't even imagine the level of pain that Thad was in, and hopefully the level of shock and adrenaline that was going through his body to where he wasn't feeling all of this pain to the fullest extent. You can only hope. Honestly, 
it's just awful and this kid who's just so evil and manipulative it's disgusting and it's evil and it's just like it's demonic honestly it really is at this point, Joe was absolutely positive that Thad could no longer escape from upstairs. So he decided to take the night off and to go celebrate and party with his girlfriend and hang out, which by the way, his girlfriend was only 13 years old and he was 17 years old. But Joe severely underestimated Thad's resiliency and the fight that Thad still had left in him. So Thad threw himself down the stairs once again, where he then passed out. When he woke up, he started making his way and crawling, but continued passing out before finally he woke up and then he would crawl a little bit more, pass out again. And this cycle continued for a while. He would get a little bit further, pass out, get a little bit further, pass out. But finally, he got to a phone. He called 911 and after 43 grueling hours, police showed up to rescue Thad. They also searched the home and what they found was mind-boggling and very disturbing. They found a notebook with 29 names separated into columns, and the columns were get to now, can wait, or the leg thing. These names listed in these individual categories, and these names were the names of the other young men that Joe was planning on hurting. And it was believed that that column, the leg thing, people that were under that, he was planning on doing the exact same thing to them that he did to Thad. After a couple of hours of searching, police finally arrested Joe, but Thad was in near fatal condition by that point. His toes were literally backwards, he had severe internal bleeding, his arms were bent and twisted, his ribs were broken, and his skin was like a rubber band. Most doctors hadn't seen such horrible injuries before, ever. Just truly awful. And remember that name Chris that Joe had told Thad about that was a previous victim? Well, it turns out that Thad actually helped solve the murder of this mysterious man, Chris. Because on July 4th in 1994, Christian Steiner went missing. The screen door of his house was cut, there were muddy footprints, and five days later, Chris was found dangling from a tree near the Wisconsin River. Ultimately, it was listed as his cause of death as a drowning, but no one had known what really happened to Chris. So after Thad had said his name, authorities literally exhumed Chris's body. They took x-rays of his legs and found that his legs were pretty much broken in the exact same way that Thad's legs were broken. So it was believed that Joe had broken Chris's legs and then tossed him in the river to drown. In Thad's case, Joe was charged with quite a few crimes. He was charged with attempted first degree intentional homicide, causing great bodily harm to a child, mayhem with the intent to disable or disfigure, and causing mental harm to a child. He pled no contest and not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. And the defense argued that Joe's biological mother, he was adopted, had been a heavy drug user throughout her entire pregnancy with Joe, and that he actually had suffered a head injury as well on a bike crash the year before. Sorry, you're not getting a pass no matter what. So in Chris's case, Joe was also charged, and he was charged with first-degree homicide, mayhem again, and causing great bodily harm to a child. Joe pled not guilty and still says that he played zero part in the death of Chris. In November of 1997, Joe was proven guilty of all of the charges, and he received a life sentence with no parole for 60 years. In 1998, he tried to make an attempt to appeal his convictions in the murder case citing lack of evidence, but the appeal was denied. So he's currently at Fox Lake Prison in Wisconsin, where he will be for the rest of his life. He's eligible for parole, but not until 2090, which he would be well over 100 years old at this point and dead. So Joe, you ain't getting out, sorry. Thad needed tons and tons of surgery and therapies, but luckily he is able to walk again. He ended up suing Joe in 1997 for $21 million. Now it's unclear whether or not he ever got any of that money because Joe has been basically in prison and he's in prison for life, so I highly doubt it. But the silver lining in all of this is not only that Thad is alive, but also that he helped solve a murder and give closure to Chris's family. Earlier that evening, we'd gone out for dinner. We came back home and we sat around for a little bit. Uh, my parents went to bed. Me and my 
youngest sister were on the couch watching TV and we'd both fallen asleep. I woke up and uh, I was being carried through my house. I really didn't think nothing of it because my dad would carry me to bed a lot of times when I'd fall asleep in the living room. I just assumed that it was the family friend and he was having car trouble and he wanted, needed some help or something. And uh, my dad probably wouldn't get up to help him, so he thought maybe I could. I asked him where his car was at, and he told me it was just right up over the hill. It was dark. I didn't really know what was going on. I just moved there. I only lived there two weeks. Um, I wasn't scared. I didn't know I should be scared. This place is a real dump. There's trash everywhere. It's garbage, old food, old dishes. I realized it wasn't a friend of the family. He told me that he was going to be having a little party, and he started naming off people that I knew from school. And he said that they were going to be coming anytime, and, you know, we're just going to hang out and have a good time. And he asked me if I was into model cars and trucks. So we went upstairs and I looked at some of his model cars and trucks. I didn't know I had anything to worry about. I've never been in a situation like that before. And the next thing I knew, he freaked out. He threw me back on his bed onto my back and he grabbed my right ankle and twisted it around till it snapped. He just sat up on the bed beside me and put his hands on his head. And as soon as he did that, I made a, made a run for it. I was so scared and confused at the time. I didn't feel much pain in my ankle, but I did feel the bone slipping past my foot bone when I was trying to run on it. A really strange feeling. I made it down his stairs, out of his bedroom, down the stairs, through the living room, and halfway through the kitchen when he caught up to me. And he got me from behind and put me in a chokehold, drug me back into his living room, threw me up against his couch, and forced my right leg up over my head until my thigh broke. My mind cannot seem to, you know, reconcile the actions in this case. If, he, if Joe was actually named as, like, his, um, what do you call it, like, you know, like, the pseudonym, or not the pseudonym, but, like, the, the name um, of these people in this ca these cases, he was called the Bone Crusher. The Bone Crusher, which is a perfect description, but just haunting. Again, the fact that he enjoyed the sounds of it and got off on it to where he would literally pleasure himself in front of his victims when he would crack and break their bones, so much so turning their kneecaps backwards, their feet backwards, it is like, guys, it's like giving me a visceral reaction right now. I can't even wrap my mind around it. I have never heard anything like this. And a lot of that I blame on you guys because you requested me to cover this case and now it is etched in my memory and it's your fault and we gotta have some choice words because I could have done without this one, guys. I really could have. I'm interested to know, though, what you guys think about this case or if you know more information because you've been following it, but... I want to know what you think about, like, not only his motive, because we know his motive. He was a sadist. He got off on it. But I don't know. I'm just, I, I can't make sense of it, guys. So I guess I'm looking for some help here. I'm looking for you guys to help me make sense of it because I don't even know where to begin. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I, my normal sign off is thanks for tuning in with me and I hope you enjoyed the case. But no thank you for tuning in with me today, guys. Like, I wish... This wasn't the case we were talking about, and I don't know nobody enjoyed it. So I, I don't know what to say. I guess I'll just leave it at until the next case, guys. Stay safe, and for the love of God, I don't know. Just stay safe. Bye.